years, the storm is coming fast, the day will soon be here. When those who are caught unprepared will be the first to fall, that much is clear. Hello and welcome to Physical Attraction, the Teot Wauki special. But we'll be examining the end of the world, one apocalypse at a time. And survive while there's people crying, people dying everywhere around. Hello, and welcome to this Teot Wauki special of Physical Attraction. This is the second part in our series on nuclear weapons. The episode's entitled The Shadow of the Bomb. When the first nuclear weapons were developed, it wasn't known what the consequences would be of detonation. There were genuine fears that the intense heat and radiation of the first explosion could ignite the atmosphere and set the whole sky ablaze. And although it was considered unlikely, the physicist Enrico Fermi, see our episode on his Fermi paradox, gave the odds at around 1 in 10. So perhaps when the first test went off without a hitch, and the scientists realised that they had succeeded in their aims and beaten the Nazis to the bomb, there might have been a brief sense of relief that the worst had not materialised but it was soon replaced by terror at the forces they had unleashed. Oppenheimer, the father of the Manhattan Project, infamously quoted Hindu scripture, Now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. A full-scale nuclear war, which in this case was assumed between the US and Russia, although there are obviously other permutations, would simulate the kind of supervolcano eruption that we dealt with earlier in the series. Vast amounts of ash, dust, and smoke would be thrown up, up to 150 million tonnes of smoke, which would likely push the climate off the brink and into another ice age. Surface temperatures would be projected to drop by 20 degrees over North America and 30 degrees over most of Eurasia. Any agricultural zones here would be completely destroyed. Combine this with the fact that all major population centres would be horribly irradiated, any survivors would become badly injured refugees, and radioactive fallout would rain from the sky, killing plants, animals, and any humans who ventured outside. There would be almost no chance of survival in the long term, unless you were locked in a bunker with decades worth of food, or somehow managed to avoid the worst of the nuclear apocalypse. Some of the radioactive isotopes have half-lives of thousands of years. Vast regions of the Earth's surface would not be habitable for decades or even centuries, and we already talked about how strontium-90 might render the crops that were grown after the nuclear war deadly to humans. Earth would perish in fire, poison, and smoke. And then it would perish in ice and radioactivity. It is difficult to imagine a more hellish scenario for the planet. We cannot know what political conditions would be like, even 20 years from now. And if you don't believe me, imagine trying to predict the world of today, in 2015, two years ago. But there need not be a deterioration of relations between the great powers. Such a war could easily be triggered by accident. Even a small-scale war with a hundred Hiroshima-sized weapons would cause a global temperature drop of 1.25 Celsius, and we've already discussed in previous shows the impact that such a small-sounding change can potentially have. Since humans realise the consequences of full-scale nuclear war, people have been trying to come up with new strategies to deal with it. Arguably the worst time was in the 1950s, when both the USSR and the USA developed H-bombs, and there were no understood rules of the game. You have to remember that we are in an era of relative peace now, but in the 1950s, nearly everyone living could remember the horrors of the Second World War, and the last time that civilian populations were attacked with nuclear weapons, and all the dreadful stories of Nazi atrocities. It is a miracle that there were any rational actors at all. Perhaps it's only the horror of the First and Second World Wars that left the pacifist urge strong enough to prevent another nuclear war. Yet there were plenty, especially in the US, who felt that the only option for world peace was for a massive, preemptive strike against the Soviet Union before they developed the capacity to retaliate. Even noted atheist and pacifist Bertrand Russell endorsed this position. It was only after the USSR demonstrated its atomic capabilities that he began to argue in favour of the total abolition of nuclear weapons which he did for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, the doctrine of mutually assured destruction was developed. The idea that the only way nuclear war could be rendered impossible was if it was symmetric. Yet even as this shaky peace held, 
people were looking at ways of getting around it. Could you destroy all of their nuclear bombers on the ground prior to launch? Could tactical nuclear weapons be fired to destroy incoming bombers in squadrons? Could weapons be sufficiently camouflaged or placed on roving submarines so that they were impervious to attack? Was it really necessary to launch an all-out strike to secure victory? When it was discovered in the Kennedy administration that the USSR only had a few functioning intercontinental ballistic missiles, this did not decrease tensions any. Instead, the US was concerned about a decapitation attack that would focus on the country's leadership. With the president and his cabinet dead, who would give the order to retaliate? In the confusion, a fleet of Soviet bombers could sweep up the rest of the country. Both sides were looking for a winning strategy. When China became a nuclear power and entered the fray, the rhetoric from Beijing was that China's larger population would allow them to survive a nuclear exchange and overrun the remaining countries in the post-apocalyptic world. Yet no one found a strategy that they felt could reliably protect them. And it's a good job too, because if one side did possess a winning strategy, who knows what would have happened. At the same time, sensing the game-changing nature of these weapons, people were arguing that the only solution was a sort of one-world utopia. A New York Times bestseller was a collection of essays, One World or None, which demanded international control over the atomic bomb. And 54% of the American people wanted the United Nations to become a world government with the power to control all military forces, including the United States. Can you imagine that? 54% of Americans in favour of a world government taking over their army. President Eisenhower, although unwilling to admit it publicly, was not willing to engage in a nuclear war. He said, quote, You cannot have this kind of war. There simply aren't enough bulldozers to scrape the bodies off the streets. But it was necessary to prepare for total war. Nobody really knew what would happen, but some hawks, like Curtis LeMay, felt that only by having hundreds of thousands of nuclear weapons could the US be truly safe. Then they would have a hope of eliminating the USSR's nuclear and military capacities in a strike, without the destruction being mutually assured. Every target would have to be pounded with multiple nuclear weapons, in case some were intercepted. The yields would have to be so large that even a target that was missed by miles would be incinerated. In the USSR, development began on a dead man's switch system, a retaliatory strike that could detonate even after the central authorities had been wiped out. But the issue with these huge stockpiles was maintaining any kind of command or control. The early warning system of the USSR was not the only one that malfunctioned from time to time. In the last episode, we talked about Stanislav Petrov's quick thinking that dealt with the false alarm. But the American system was equally prone to vulnerabilities. The NORAD early warning system once flashed up with a threat level of 5. This means, according to the computer and the protocols, that there was a 99.9% chance that the US was under an attack. The vice commander asked a crucial question. Where was Nikita Khrushchev? At the time, he was the leader of the Soviet Union. And he was in New York, attending the United Nations. This was the main reason that the base commanders decided that it was indeed a false alarm. Launching an attack that killed your own leader was pretty dark, even by Soviet standards. The computerised defence system had mistakenly identified dozens of long-range missiles heading towards American cities. It was, in fact, detecting the moon. On another occasion, a worker at NORAD accidentally loaded the wrong tape into one of its computers. Fighter and bomber crews were scrambled, missile teams were put on high alert, as all of the computers of NORAD showed vast arrays of nuclear missiles raining down from the Soviets. The tape had been one of a training exercise. It had caused the computers to report a realistic nuclear missile strike from the USSR taking place. If the situation was bad in the United States, it could be even worse in her NATO allies. Many of these countries, for example Italy, had strong communist parties who had an obvious motivation for stealing a nuclear weapon. Weapons were often transported and handled by military personnel from the different nations, some of whom were at war with each other, as in the case of Turkey and Greece. In one incident, a hurried nuclear test was carried out in the Sahara Desert by French forces in Algeria. Why did they carry out this unscheduled nuclear test? They were afraid of a potential coup, which would cause the weapon to fall into the wrong hands. Algeria was fighting for its independence at the time. The weapons were poorly maintained, and the instruction manuals were in English, 
often incomprehensible to the troops who handled them. Sometimes, inspectors would find screwdrivers and wrenches inside the bombs. On one occasion, an inspector looked on, amazed, as a group of NATO weapons handlers pulled out the arming wires on a nuclear bomb as they removed it from a plane. This started the arming sequence. If the bomb had been dropped on the ground by mistake, it could have detonated. My point in focusing on these errors is not to malign or disparage the military or their safety procedures for handling nuclear weapons. It's a miracle, given how dangerous these things are, that they have been kept safe for so long. Although there have been lapses, the thing is that's inevitable. The point is, when you have a hell of a lot of nuclear weapons that need to be on high alert, deployed and redeployed in regions around the world, when the numbers are large enough, mistakes are inevitable regardless of how careful you are. Given the numbers of weapons, and given time, the one in a billion probabilities, they all add up until the overall chance of some mistake occurring approaches certainty. It is a miracle that there have not been any accidental detonations to date, but I'm not sure we can continue to trust our luck. And this is quite apart from the idea that war could be intentionally triggered, or a weapon could fall into the wrong hands. For years at the height of the Cold War, it would have only taken two officers or the crew of a single B-52 or Soviet bomber to go rogue to trigger a nuclear war. That's all it could have taken to eliminate the human race. Over 1,500 of the people in these nuclear weapons handling facilities, they lost their security clearance due to drug use, including on some occasions LSD and cocaine. So if you're not concerned about the LSD taking cocaine heads who run on nuclear weapons or ran on nuclear weapons during the Cold War, there were other risks too. If you don't count the two near misses due to malfunctioning missile radars, and whatever other incidents we never got to hear about, then the closest we came to nuclear war was probably the Cuban Missile Crisis. Robert McNamara, who was there, said that he later estimated humanity's chances of being killed in a nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis, as somewhere between 1 in 6 and 1 in 4. Now those aren't, eh, it'll never happen, odds. Those are betting odds. The Cuban Missile Crisis kicked off after the US deployed ballistic missiles in Italy and Turkey. Just the year before, frustrated and threatened by the communist island of Cuba just off their coastline, the US had attempted to topple the Castro regime with the Bay of Pigs invasion. The idea was that the CIA would covertly sponsor a whole load of exiles from Cuba who disliked the regime, to overthrow the government. There would be a thin veneer, then, of plausible deniability. President Kennedy could claim that he wasn't directly invading Cuba, but that it was these Cuban exiles who were retaking the country. Unfortunately, the world quickly realised that the airplanes bombing the Cuban airfields were really US planes with false flag Cuban markers. The Soviets warned of a nuclear strike if US forces were further committed, and so Kennedy withdrew further support from the invasion. This left the Cuban exiles who had been recruited and trained by the CIA in a terrible situation, without support, and three days later they were defeated. In response to this embarrassing debacle, the Kennedy government became even more aggressive in its rhetoric against Cuba, and the Cuban authorities requested that the USSR should deter future invasions by placing missiles on the island. The Cuban Missile Crisis shows us the misunderstandings that can take place between two nuclear-armed powers. This was around the time that nuclear weapons were transitioning from being delivered by bombers, to using intercontinental ballistic missiles. Kennedy had run for election on the platform of avoiding a missile gap, believing that the Soviets were far advanced in terms of this technology. In reality, the USSR only had 20 IBCMs, and they didn't entrust them to be anywhere near as accurate enough to hit the continental US. This is why the missiles in Turkey and Italy were such a concern for them. The US thought that they were just restoring parity, but in reality, these missiles meant that the US was far more capable of a first strike than the USSR. So even if you think they were rational actors, they have imperfect information, and that leads to misunderstandings and escalations. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were up to 15 incidents that could each have caused a nuclear war, down to these on-the-ground misunderstandings, when everyone was tense and alert. Given all that had happened with the Bay of Pigs invasion and the missiles in Italy and Turkey, Nikita Khrushchev approved of missiles being deployed on the island of Cuba in July 1962. They were smuggled in under the guise of supplies for Cuba, but by October the US had spotted them in aerial reconnaissance photos. 
The crisis began on October 15th when JFK was notified. The Joint Chiefs of Staff in charge of military affairs recommended a full invasion of Cuba, calling the Soviets bluff, who had made guarantees in public and private to the Cuban leadership that they would respond to an invasion with Cuba with a nuclear force. JFK felt, probably rightly, that such an action would have to provoke a Soviet response. This might not necessarily be a nuclear attack. You have to remember at the time, the city of West Berlin was surrounded entirely, a small enclave of Western territory, within the East Germany, which was a Soviet country. And they could well have retaliated through West Berlin, invaded that, and that would have escalated perhaps into a full-scale conflict. The situation was worse than anyone knew at the time. Over a hundred tactical nuclear warheads were delivered to Cuba, and the local Soviet commander had the ability, although not the authority, to launch them without additional codes from Moscow. Who knows what would have happened if he feared for his life in the case of an invasion. After announcing to the nation and the world that the missiles had been discovered, things got a little heated. Kennedy drew up plans to invade Cuba, while the Soviets were threatening nuclear retaliation if the invasion took place. US bombers were on 24-7 missions at the Soviet border, on constant alert, ready to strike if the order was given. A blockade around the island of Cuba was established, and US and Soviet ships were in a tense standoff, potentially at risk of firing on each other. Any small misunderstanding could have escalated into a full-scale nuclear war, and there were people on both sides urging the leaders on, to an invasion of Cuba or to fire on the blockade, which could have snowballed. Eventually, after a lot of sleepless nights were all involved, Khrushchev and Kennedy found the remedy. A secret deal. The USSR would remove its missiles from Cuba. The US would secretly dismantle and remove the missiles from Italy and Turkey. But the day this was agreed in secret was in fact the riskiest day of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And few people knew why until years later. On that day, 27th of October 1962, a Soviet submarine B-59 was equipped with nuclear torpedoes. It had run into trouble and was being pursued by the US Navy in international waters. To avoid the US Navy, they'd sunk deep into the ocean, so deep that they couldn't pick up radio transmissions from the surface. That meant that they had no communications with Moscow, and hadn't for a while. The USS Beale dropped depth charges on the submarine in an attempt to force it to come to the surface and identify itself. A warning shot. For all that the crew of the B-59 knew, The nuclear war that many had expected due to the escalating Cuban Missile Crisis had begun, and the depth charges were intended to destroy the submarine. The depth charges damaged the air conditioning unit of the submarine, which began to overheat unbearably. Carbon dioxide began to build up in the vessel. The captain of the submarine had no way of knowing that this wasn't wasn't nuclear war, and he gave the order to fire their nuclear torpedo at the ships. On any other submarine in the flotilla, His orders would have been obeyed immediately, the nuclear torpedo would have vaporised the US sailors, and a nuclear first strike would have happened, chances are there would have been war. But this particular submarine also hosted a man called Vasily Arpikov, who was in command of the whole fleet, and technically had the same rank as the captain. He was not in favour of launching the nuclear torpedo. He decided that the US Navy was intentionally missing the submarine, trying to force them to surface, but not actually attacking them. After what you can imagine was a pretty tense standoff between two men who were effectively of equal rank almost, they surfaced to await orders from Moscow. Had he not done that, the US Navy ships would have been vaporised by nuclear force, fallout would have spread across the continental United States, and a full-scale nuclear war that would have obliterated hundreds of cities and hundreds of millions of people probably would have been triggered. And you'll remember from our first episode that Arkhipov isn't even the first person who can claim to save the world. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, information was liberalised. The threat from nuclear war between the two superpowers may have receded, but information about the number of nuclear accidents and errors began to leak out. And more and more people were allowed to see the top-secret US war plans. One of them was General Butler, who said, quote, With the possible exception of the Soviet war plan, this was the single most absurd and irresponsible document I had seen in my entire life. I came to fully appreciate the truth. We escaped the Cold War without a nuclear holocaust by some combination of skill, luck, and divine intervention, and I suspect the latter in the greatest proportion. End quote. 
But with the end of the Cold War, people are thinking less and less about nuclear weapons. The systems are ageing, they're being less funded, they're not in the public consciousness or the subject of frequent political discussion. A recent Guardian report about the ageing control systems for these devices might spark a little alarm. Quote, The US Strategic Automated Command and Control System, which is used to send and receive emergency action messages to the US nuclear forces, runs on a 1970s IBM computer platform. End quote. It still uses those massive 8-inch floppy disks. Shockingly, the US Government Accountability Office said that replacement parts for the system are difficult to find, because they're now obsolete. And many people no longer even know how to operate these systems as their original creators retire. Yet the fact remains that there is still enough missile capacity left to destroy the human race several times over. And new threats from North Korea, who recently tested an H-bomb, from India and Pakistan, and from Iran need to be considered. Pakistan's nuclear weapons are entirely controlled by the military. It's not impossible to imagine that a coup might take place and destabilise a nuclear power. North Korea recently demonstrated that it has an intercontinental ballistic missile that is capable of reaching the United States. And although we have some way to go before they can create a miniaturised warhead that could survive re-entry, they will surely not have enough faith in their targeting abilities for some time before they could consider striking the US. But it's again exposed our vulnerabilities in a world where these weapons exist. What do you do when it appears that a regime you don't like is on the brink of developing enough of a nuclear capability to really be on a par with a dominant global superpower, and being a party to this idea of mutually assured destruction? Some people argue that the only way around it is a preemptive strike that destroys this regime before they get there. But North Korea's example shows that we really can't risk the possibility that, even if the US is safe, Seoul or Tokyo could be destroyed with a nuclear bomb. The safety of the world at the moment depends on the idea that Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump are both rational actors who will do the right thing. Yeah. In 2003, as Eric Schlosser quotes, half of the Air Force responsible for nuclear weapons failed their safety tests, despite being given a three-day warning of inspections. He also points out that 9-11 exposed that the US is still vulnerable to a decapitation-style attack. In a genuine emergency, orders were consistently not received, communication broke down, and the President wasn't on board Air Force One, even though there could have been attacks targeted at him, after four or five minutes. In 2008, a UN resolution was passed that would de-alert the nuclear weapons of the major powers. This would take them off the high hair-trigger alerts that shorten the decision-making time, but also render mistakes and errors more likely. It was voted for by 134 countries, but it was blocked by France, the United Kingdom, the United States, which all have vetoes. In rebuttal to this veto, these nations said, quote, Common sense tells us that there is no way to construct a control and command system that employs thousands of human beings and computers, which is completely impervious to failure. Nothing is foolproof to a sufficiently talented fool. Recent authoritative scientific studies have predicted that if the US-Russian high-alert missiles are ever launched and their warheads detonated over cities, the environmental consequences of this nuclear war would cause the destruction of most, if not all, human beings. This is unacceptable because there is not now, and has never been, a national or political goal that justifies the complete destruction of all nations and peoples. Regardless of the degree of risk, however small it might be, it is immoral and illogical to take this chance. No nation or nations have the right to jeopardise the survival of humanity or life on Earth. End quote. It is a miracle that we have avoided nuclear war, or nuclear error. A large part of this has to be credited to the militaries involved. The decision-making of individuals like Petrov and heads of state who acted with cooler heads, and the safety protocols that have meant none of the many accidents we've talked about ever led to a nuclear explosion. But accidents will happen. And if we've learned anything, we should know that people cannot be trusted. You might trust the individuals, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, Theresa May, Emmanuel Macron, Modi and Hussein, as I write this, and Kim Jong-un as well. You may trust these individuals not to allow things to escalate to the scale of nuclear war. You may trust the people of today. But what about the leaders that could arise tomorrow? What about when the party you don't like is in power? What then? One idea that was presented to prevent the use of atomic weapons I particularly liked. It was proposed, of course, at the heart of the Cold War. It was from Harvard law professor Roger Fisher, 
He said, quote, There is a young man, probably a Navy officer, who accompanies the President. This young man has a black attaché case which contains the codes that are needed to fire nuclear weapons. I could see the President at a staff meeting considering nuclear war as an abstract question. He might conclude, On PSYOP Plan 1, the decision is affirmative. Communicate the Alpha Line XYZ. Such jargon holds what is involved at a distance. My suggestion was quite simple. Put that needed code number in a little capsule, and then implant that capsule right next to the heart of a volunteer. The volunteer would carry with him a big, heavy butcher knife as he accompanied the president. If the president ever wanted to fire nuclear weapons, the only way he could do so would be for him to first, with his own hands, to kill one human being. The president says, George, I'm sorry, but tens of millions must die. He has to look at someone and realise what death is. What an innocent death is. Blood on the White House carpet. It's reality brought home. When I suggested to some friends in the Pentagon this, they said, My God, that's terrible. Having to kill someone would distort the president's judgment. He might never push the button. End quote. Another similar proposal suggested that even having to kill someone wouldn't be sufficient deterrence for some leaders. Instead, we should ensure that people in the chain of command of nuclear-armed countries must have some of their loved ones living in a rival country. Essentially, they'd be very well taken care of political hostages to prevent a nuclear war. The same kind of thing that royal families did in the Middle Ages to prevent war between powers. Mr. President, you may be able to give the order and retreat to your bunker, but the blood on your hands will be that of your family as well. The mutually assured destruction doctrine has kept us safe, and it's probably responsible for the fact that conflict between the world's major superpowers has been limited to small proxy wars rather than all-out annihilation. Just as the peace that arose due to the Roman Empire dominating and occupying so much territory was referred to as the Pax Romanum, people refer to this peace as the Pax Atomica. But we all remember what happened to the Roman Empire. The world turned, the world changed, and the empire fell apart. What if some new technology means that new mutually assured destruction no longer applies? Is it so unrealistic to imagine that one country develops a system that can shoot down missiles? That's what Reagan wanted to do with Star Wars. And suddenly that country is free to strike with a much lower risk of retaliation. When Gorbachev complained to Reagan that Star Wars would allow the US to strike the USSR with impunity, Reagan replied that of course if Star Wars worked they would freely give it to the Soviets for them to use as well. Yeah, right, if you believe that, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. The whole point of mutually assured destruction involves keeping both sides in a state of constant tension, convincing them that you'll wipe them out if they ever dream of striking. You have to be really belligerent. What if political leaders decide that now they have this kind of supremacy, they could reasonably strike and destroy all of the existing facilities on either side to prevent retaliation? But let's say you trust all of your political leaders, and every political leader who will arise in the future. Even when you've seen how easy it is for a state to fall into the hands of a small extremist cabal when things go wrong. What about the possibility of an accidental nuclear war? The Global Catastrophic Risk Institute. They studied the scenario with the available information that they have on nuclear protocols. In the scenarios they ran, the annual probability of an accidental nuclear war ranged from 0.000001, which would give a nuclear war on average once every 100,000 years, all the way up to 0.07, a 7% chance of an accidental nuclear war occurring each year. If that's true, you can expect one on average every 14 years. If that's true, it's a miracle we've not been wiped out already. This is an intractable problem. I don't see any credible way that all sides will truly agree to disarm themselves, but they may reduce the risks through better communication, better cooperation, more politics. But when the first nuclear test was successful, the world changed forever. Right now, we might be able to forget about it for large periods of time. We can always debate these things in an abstract, intellectual way, play-acting as being war gamers, master strategists, and bibbling about grand ideas like mutually assured destruction and rational actors. In our thinking, though, I think we need a dose of blood. The same way the president who has to stab his friend to launch a nuclear strike realises the gravity of his situation more than the one who rattles off some obscure launch code 
or talks about devastating the abilities of the opponent to retaliate. We need this blood, because if we're not careful, there will be blood. Unimaginable destruction. The entire species. The fate of the planet. It's always unfolding in the shadow of the bomb. Thanks for listening to this Teotwalki series. I hope that I haven't given you all too many nightmares. I should also point out that most of the most deadly apocalyptic scenarios I've described are completely within human control. They should not act as grimly depressing horrors, but as warnings. If we do not improve, this could be what awaits us. So let's improve. I want to leave off this series with the words of Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, who works at the Centre for Existential Risk, from his book about existential risks. He said, quote, Choices on how science is applied, to medicine, the environment, and so forth, should be debated far beyond the scientific community. This is one reason why it's important that a wide public should have a basic feel for science, knowing at least the difference between a proton and a protein. Otherwise, such debate won't get beyond slogans, or will be conducted at megaphone level via sensational headlines in tabloid newspapers. End quote. I'm having so much fun with the series that it's not quite over yet. We'll be back soon with some bonus Teotwalki episodes before returning to normal physical attraction shows. Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, anywhere you like. Ask some questions. Which of the apocalyptic scenarios, now that we've run through them all, do you think we really missed? There's a few that we'll talk about that I think are merit bonus episodes, but uh, it'd be interesting to see what you guys think. And as ever, on the Twitter physics pod, you can donate to the show if you think we've been doing a good job through PayPal. And uh, depending on how many of you guys there are, I may well set up a Patreon soon. We'll have to see. Until then, then, stay safe. You better make some preparations. There's no time for hesitations. Compile a list of tips. Our theme music is Get Ready for the Apocalypse by Astrometrics. Do get ready.